did, we tend to see motor vehicles and other small drivers. So just something to keep in mind. Does anybody have any questions for myself or Officer Krieger, who is also on the District 2 Park team? And the third officer is not here tonight. Surprise. All right. <laughs> I have a question. This is in regards to the, to the 911 dispatch. And especially with the incident that happened along Colfax and Xenia in Denver and the whole, and I know that's the border of um, Aurora Yosemite, but there are concerns with 911 dispatch in general, because people have called 911 and not gotten appropriate response or timely response. So are we, is the APD evaluating 911 dispatch, reevaluating um, timeliness, um, if it's even going to the appropriate departments? And I know that at Havana and Parker, that's a crapshoot of which side of the sidewalk you're on as to where it goes. So that is a great concern, especially what happened recently with the um, person who was shot in Denver, but it went to Aurora first. And I know that there have been also incidents of people calling 911 on accidents and having, you know, being sent to the wrong place or being on hold for hours they call back and ask for an officer and then it goes to oh just do an online report after four and a half hours right yeah and I, I totally feel in your frustrations when and I feel a lot of phone calls in the regards to what you're saying about calling police department and uh, or calling dispatch 911, nobody answering, or it takes a prolonged amount of time for somebody to answer, especially more so on the non emergency number, um, not the 911 line. That sometimes it actually goes to an automated you know, message and then they have to call back and call back. And that's just calls of service coming in. I know that uh, they're actively trying to hire more dispatchers from last I heard, that they're trying to train more dispatchers and get more people up there. There is some police presence up there, but it's ran by outside of the police department so it requires them having to not just hire more call takers and dispatchers but also to train them um, but i completely understand your frustration i'd be just as frustrated as far as i think you had a second question um, yeah with on online reporting that is going to be turning into a thing where there's going to make certain calls mandated uh, that will be if there's no suspect information like viable suspect information that those calls are going to lean towards online reporting. Um, as far as waiting, you know, four or five hours for, a, for an officer to arrive, everything is prioritized when somebody calls 911 or the non emergency number, priority one, two, three, four, and so on. Priority one is if somebody's life's in danger, it's an active crime or an assault or something. So basically, with that, it requires an immediate response from police officers. But in a time where there's just fewer police officers on the street, even on a priority one, sometimes those can be pending for a while. If, let's say myself and the rest of the team are on another priority one, a shots fired call or somebody gets shot, and then that's where, let's say it was in District 1, because that's kind of where you're talking about the District 1 mm -hmm. Denver border, they would probably pull from District 2 and District 3 officers to come help out. So just because it's a priority one doesn't necessarily mean they will try to get officers there as soon as possible, but if there's just no manpower to, to put over there, then it's just going to be one of those things where it's, it waits a little longer. Not that they want it to, it's just that there's nobody to take the call. If it is something very pressing, they will reach out to different districts or even if they had to even have Denver come out and help if that was the case, if it was such quick, if it was so close to Denver. Um, in priority two and three calls, you know, if you called in an area watch on Friday night, it may be until the next morning before an officer goes out there. It just depends on the call load. I hope I answered some of those questions. Not really, because my concern, <laughs> no, because what they found out with the, the incident was that the Verizon Tower or whatever was all messed up. But it's two, three blocks from Yosemite, and yet it was routed to Aurora. So is APD working with Denver and Verizon and all the other tower, you know, providers to make sure that the calls, if it goes to 911, goes to the appropriate 
say that? that would be a better question for dispatch. I, I'm, I'm boots on the ground. I'm not, I don't work with Verizon. <laughs> I, I have no idea. That's something that would be a great question for dispatch to decide how they monitor how calls are coming and, and how they get dispatched out. So, how do we talk about it through dispatch? So, don't say access a warrant. <laughs> no, I wasn't actually going to say access. I was going to say me. You, uh, I'll, I can put in a council request for you on that. It'll go to Aurora. Uh, to our, yeah, Aurora 911. Um, that's our dispatch. So for those of y'all who know, uh, who don't know, 911 used to just be MAPD, but we, uh, I think, uh, City Manager Twombly a couple of years back moved it out, so it's now its own standalone department. And whenever you dial 911, that's where our calls are getting routed to. Uh, and from there, they basically decide: Does your call need? you know, uh, APD, does it need AFR? Uh, does it need the crisis response team? Does it need the Aurora mobile response team? Um, and as we continue to add other services, it's, there's potential that that menu of options could increase as well. But that's where we need to actually route this conversation to. So um, I'm happy to uh, talk to you after the meeting, Ellen, and we can get a council request one for you on that, okay? So, so the 911 number, I mean, I think everybody knows 911 is emergency. On this, like, what, what is the police non emergency? I don't see it. It's not. I don't see it. Okay. Well, I have it on the back of my card, so I'll give you one. Okay. <laughs> but I don't already have it on there, which should be. So, yeah. You used to have it. So. Okay. Thank you. Sir. I'll let them know that it's missing, though. Thank you. On like a couple of nights ago, I guess there was a shooting on Colfax Dealer, and I was just driving with my mom, and I saw eleven police cars there. And sometimes I kind of, I don't, I kind of say to my mom like, if you rob something, you could rob something right now because you have eleven police cars in one place. And I, I read up more on it and said that the reason the police cars were there, I guess the public was coming towards the officers, um, and that's why more police came. But how? long did the police stay there and that's a lot of police cars for a shooting and it's just 11 cars and is there more officers around or different areas that are kind of working this area too I'm just trying to understand it more because I was like well, I counted 11 I was like it's a lot of police cars well, so, we have a critical incident like that a major crime that has occurred other districts will come and fill in the void. So if there's a, uh, a call of a shooting and it requires a lot of resources, let's say on the west side of District 1, District 2 and District 3 officers, assuming they're not working shootings too, which God willing that doesn't happen all often that all three districts are working shootings simultaneously, but they'll pull some resources over to kind of fill in. But is there some voids in certain areas? Absolutely there are. Especially if it's a large scene um, and that requires more resources, you're definitely going to have certain voids around the city where we are probably a little more susceptible like you said all these officers are working on a shooting call is it you know if a robbery comes out there will be officers sent to that right away because they'll fall from district two or district three but is there probably a lapse of coverage temporarily i'm sure there is yeah because i was just wondering because when i drove by i saw officers they were standing around i didn't see any people towards it i don't know where they were to to cause more, you know, officers to go there. But how long after, if an incident like that happens, do the officers stay before they go, okay, this is under control and we're gonna go? It, it totally depends on um, each each one of those calls. It, once they have it under control, and let's say the suspect's in custody and um, everything's kind of just fading out, then officers will get released. So they're just gonna make sure that they're able to control the scene. If there's evidence to collect, they're gonna make sure that they have a, uh, you know, the scene's controlled for CSI to come in and do their collection of evidence. Or if the fire, the fire department's there, we're gonna make sure that they're safe to get whatever done that they have to get done. We're not just gonna leave and then leave CSI or fire out there, so. It just seems you guys, it seems like we're, you guys are short-staffed enough and then when stuff like that happens, then other incidents that might happen are kind of put on the side, I guess. 
until that straightened out. So I just, no. I just noticed there were like ten, like eleven, right. cops, like more than like twelve cops, and I was like, it looked like nothing was, it looked like the situation was calm and there was no people around, and so I was just, I was just trying to understand that whole incident, and and when we drove back, which was like twenty minutes later, there were still all those cop cars there, so I was just wondering. That's all. Was that Monday night? I believe so. That was the homicide. On, and typically on those, we'll stay there until everything's processed. It just depends on how long it may take. If it happens at night, they'll want us to kind of stay there for daylight to get different pictures, oh, different okay. things that come with the daytime versus the nighttime. And that scene was chaotic. I, we didn't respond on that. Um, but it, it occurred also at the hospital, and it occurred somewhere else, and there was another incident the other night that followed up with that too. So. And police officers are going to have to hold the scene a lot of times and wait for search warrants. So, you know, and, and to hold off a certain area, let's say it's a, an apartment building, for example, or a specific unit, they're going to put at least a couple officers just to sit there and hold the unit, even though we're really not doing anything. We can't go in. We're just standing there to, for, for protection of uh, integrity of the, of the crime scene. Yeah, I was just wondering because if yeah. someone gets robbed or someone like a house gets robbed or someone gets there are vulnerable I mean, moments, you're right. I mean when all those resources get pulled to one spot, the city, especially in certain parts or a certain part of the district, is definitely gonna be a little more vulnerable at that moment. There's no question. In fact we've had um, I'm sure we've both seen it a bunch of times where, you know, somebody might call in some road call, shots fired over here. And it's to get a lot of attention from the police to go to that area, and it's totally not, it never happened. And then you'll have a robbery come out. I mean, that does happen. And they, I mean, bad guys know that too, right? Like, I'll call in a shots fired with multiple people down and get units pushing that way, and then I'll go rob a bank six miles away because all the police are going this way. So it does happen. Yeah, I just, it's just interesting how different areas of Aurora have more high issues with crime. And, I mean, I'm on D District 3, but I'm on 6 in Havana, and that, right down on First Street, that's like a, <laughs> I mean, there's, it just seems like different areas, even Colfax right down there, just, there's hot pockets of different areas, so, thank you. Of course. And then we continue that conversation through that ecosystem, uh, and now we are, today, we are going to talk about the public defender um, side of things. Um, so, with that, Doug, I'll give you the floor. Uh, thanks. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, sorry, that was a little confusing up here. I thought I was going to be on the screen. I have to have knee replacement surgery in the morning, so I was trying to get ready at home. So if I look a little disheveled, it's because I am. Uh, <laughs> 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 so I'm Doug Wilson. I am the public defender for the city. I'm going to cut my steel down a little bit. First off, I actually like police officers. So I just want everybody to know that since they're sitting here in the audience. Um, I have been a public defender since 1981, actually before that. When I was in law school, I worked, I went to the University of Cincinnati. I was in the public defender's office in Hamilton County, Ohio. I then graduated, I came to Colorado. I was a state public defender. And so Colorado has, uh, is in a very unique setting. There are, is a state PD's office. Um, I progressed through that system until 2006 when I was appointed to run the state system. State so, yep, sorry to interrupt you. Yep. Just, there you, you have to hold it a little closer. Yeah. Okay. Really oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right. Please, y'all, speak up if you can't hear. <laughs> this has been uh, not my best night with technology. Nice. That, that was on us. That was on us. You're good. All right, so why am I telling you this? Because there's this unique situation that Colorado has when it comes to public defender offices. In 1963, actually uh, March 18th of 1963, which means 60 years in 2023, is the celebration for public defender world as to when poor people were granted the right to have court appointed counsel in a case called Gideon versus Wainwright. So I'm sure the city of Aurora is going to celebrate that in March because it's the sixth year anniversary of why our office is actually created. The state public defender system was created in 1970, and we handle handled 
uh, everything from driving under the influence to death penalty cases. And when I was appointed to run that system in 2006, I ran it for 12 years, I retired, uh, I was playing a lot of golf, and I got recruited to come to Aurora. Uh, not knowing that when I started in January of 20, that COVID would be hitting and protests would be hitting and our courthouse was boarded up for over a year. Um, all of that was obviously not something anyone knew and I certainly wasn't prepared to walk into that. The difference between the state PD though and Aurora Municipal Public Defender's Office is the level of offenses that can be charged. State, that's where all the felonies go. State, that's where a lot of the misdemeanors go. But your Aurora Police Department has the ability to charge some misdemeanor offenses in either state court or in Aurora Municipal Court. And so there's concurrent jurisdiction between the city of Aurora, which as you all know, sits in three counties, um, or they can be charged and sent to the state. Um, my office now, compared to what I used to run, which was 850 people and a $98 million budget, is now 18 people, and we have a little bit less than a $2 million budget in the city of Aurora. Why did Gideon come about? Gideon versus Wainwright came about because when the state, the federal, any government entity wants to prosecute a citizen, before 1963, if you were poor, you had to defend yourself. And Mr. Gideon went to prison in Florida for um, allegedly, I'll tell you why I say allegedly, robbing a pool hall of some change and some beer. And Mr. Gideon, from his jail cell, petitions the United States Supreme Court, asking them to appoint counsel for him because the Florida State Court refused to do so. They heard the case, they made a decision that yes, in fact, government entities have to provide counsel to poor people if you are facing incarceration. If you get a speeding ticket, you're on your own. Uh, <clears throat> if you're charged as a juvenile in Aurora, you're on your own. We don't represent juveniles because they're not looking at jail time. If the prosecutor stands up and says, we're not going to seek jail, we're not going to ask this person to go to jail if they're convicted, you're not entitled to counsel. It's only if there's a possible incarceration attached to the offense. Why is Aurora so unique? Because there are only five standalone municipal public defender offices in the country. Colorado has two. Denver, which just started about five years ago, and Aurora, which started in 1990. And it was patterned after the state system that was started in 1970. And so Aurora City Council created the public defender system um, in Aurora as an independent agency, which tends to drive some folks in the city a little crazy because I don't work for the city manager, I don't work for city council. Um, <clears throat> Councilmember McConnell is not technically my boss, though he does control my budget. Um, <laughs> I was appointed by an independent commission that is appointed by city council, and that's the same way that the state is set up. And the concept is we have to be independent from political influence, we have to be independent from judicial influence, because we represent folks that not a lot of people really care about or would prefer they didn't have a lawyer. What's the, what's the hot topic in Aurora right now as far as crime? Auto theft. Auto theft, motor vehicle theft. Uh, city Council just passed an ordinance. It's the first one in the country. Um, I'll, I'll save my editorializing, but it's the first one in the country <laughs> that's gonna be a minimum mandatory jail sentence if you're convicted of motor vehicle theft or if you fail to appear in court. So don't fail to appear. Um, it's 
going to get tested. It doesn't. It's not been signed into law, but it will be here actually pretty quickly. And we are going to get at that same public safety meeting that where the um, ketamine replacement was discussed. I don't know the drugs in there. There was also a discussion about Aurora police are going to file most of the motor vehicle thefts in the city of Aurora because the sentences are now going to be harsher than they would be if you got filed on in state court with the misdemeanor. So we're going to see a great influx in our caseload <clears throat> and workload, primarily because now the prosecutors can't waive jail. It's a mandatory jail sentence. So if an adult is charged and they're looking at first time conviction 60 days, uh, repeat offenders 120 days, they're going to get counsel. And we don't know what that looks like yet. Hopefully the city council recognizes that in our budget this year. <laughs> um, I'm not suggesting motor vehicle theft isn't an issue. I, in fact, I think it's a huge problem. I just don't think minimum mandatories are the way to solve the problem personally. I hope Aurora starts looking at what Denver did, uh, wait, city council member, um, which is take away the economic incentive in selling stolen catalytic converters. Right? If you take away the incentive, yes, sir. That's good news on that. Right. So Council Member Gardner and I actually submitted that same idea at the same time. I think he's actually running it because he already had a meeting scheduled. But we're going to be uh, we're going to end up with an ordinance in the city of Aurora, hopefully, um, to basically remove the economic incentive for uh, theft of catalytic converters and also tighten our language uh, generally around uh, the theft of other auto parts of significant value as well. So and I think that's the way you attack these things. Well, I will editorialize. Well, I, you know, it's just if you take away the economic incentive, right, who's going to buy it? And I think if you bring a bag full of kind of like converters into your shop, maybe you ought to ask a couple questions, like where it came from, before you start paying people money. That's what Denver, is it go, what about the Denver part of it where they ask? So that, that was part of why I think we both submitted, because their whole idea is like if we basically use their ordinance as a template, we all end up with the same distance, uh, basically we all remove that economic incentive. The state could also do it. Well, rather, the state did, yeah. but they set their limit at $300 well, per right. item, which is ridiculously high. That's still a significant incentive, in my opinion. Uh, ours is 30 So I think that that will hopefully do the trick. And also, if you if you come in with more than one, you then have to prove that it's a legitimate business, that you have a legitimate business and a legitimate reason to actually have them. So. So are they going to also keep a log of? Yes, there's a log you have to do. I think fingerprints, ID, photo, etc. Yeah, it's basically treated like a pawn shop. Yep. Um, yep. So that's the idea. All right. So I'm going to digress for just a second. I'm going to, there's a little quiz here. I assume we all believe in the Constitution, right? All right. <laughs> Bill of Rights. There are ten, ten Bill of There's ten amendments when they did the Bill of Rights. You guys name them. Tell me what they stand for and why they protect you. I didn't know I had to bring my pocket constitution with me today, Doug. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what's number one? Freedom of speech and religion. Uh -huh. What's number two? That's it. Number two, come on. Number two is a big one. Right? Come on, guys, help me out. Yeah. <laughs> right to bear arms. Right to bear arms, absolutely. Well regulated militia. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Juan. Um, I'm going to skip three. What's four? Uh, illegal search and seizure. Uh, right. That Mar-a-Lago thing that just happened, the those warrants. Um, number five? You have the right to remain silent. Right to remain silent. More of our clients did have less convictions. Um, <laughs> number six? Right to effective assistance of counsel. You know, that's what gives that's what Gideon's built on is your right to counsel. So it's not just rich people, it's poor people. Okay? We're gonna skip seven. What's eight? Cruel and unusual punishment. Cruel and unusual punishment. Fines? No excessive fines. So what why am I doing this? Because as much disdain as there is for a lot of my compadres in the public defender world. 40% of the Bill of Rights were set up to 
protect the individual criminal defendant against the government. We have a tendency to stop at Amendment 1 and Amendment 2 pretty much everywhere in the country. I love Amendment 1 and Amendment 2, but 4, 5, 6, and 8 is where we live. And I would argue Amendment 2 as well, at least in my last job, because of self-defense. People had the right to bear arms and protect themselves. So I would argue even 50% of the Bill of Rights by our founding fathers. So when I hear people scream and holler about my constitutional right, blah, 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 that's great. Except you forget that the person that just stole your car, 50% of the Bill of Rights was set up to protect him or her from being convicted and going to jail or prison. So, when you get in an argument with your family, uh, what an ass the public defenders are, just remember that without those Bill of Rights, you wouldn't have those protections either. It's not just to protect my clients, it's to protect your house from being searched, it's to give you the right to have a lawyer, it's to give you the right to say, I don't have to give evidence against myself under the Fifth Amendment. And no, you can't give me an excessive fine or punish me inappropriately because the Constitution says so. Okay? I'm going to stop talking for a minute. Um, if you guys have questions, because I can, I'm a lawyer, I can do this all <laughs> night. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go back to the motor theft thing. Mm -hmm. So, Council member, where are we going to house everybody? Oh, well, it's a great question. Um, my understanding is that the Arapahoe County and Adams County sheriffs have both said we have room at the jail. So, you know, Aurora's municipal jail is really a holding facility. Mm -hmm. We can't keep people for more than, I think, two days? 72 hours. Okay, three days. Thank you. So, it's on a long term facility. So, we have to make sure that they have room to go elsewhere. Otherwise, they get released. Um, and that, that's basically where that has landed. Okay, so we, there were issues in the past that the city of Aurora would not pay Adams County to house the city of Aurora people. Mm -hmm. And I think at one time, Arapahoe County also had that issue a law that if it's more than $2,000 in damage, it's a felony anyways. So in, take for instance, if it is a stolen vehicle and number, and you have to catch the person first, yeah. that's another issue. So- You gotta talk to those guys about oh that. Oh no, <laughs> okay, so a year, a year this Saturday, Stolen vehicle, he ran, mine was num car number four. Total damages of the whole incident was more than 2,000. There are four totaled cars. Okay. So, would- I don't think I represented it if that's your question. So, <laughs> <laughs> they not caught the person, ah. as far as I know. Yeah. Did you get your car back? Yes. <laughs> yes. I don't want to talk I, spot, but but do you know what the recovery rate is? 70 some percent. Okay. Mm -hmm. recovery. What's the clearance rate for motor vehicle theft cases? Did you say 70 percent? I don't know. 70? 70? I imagine it's pretty hard to catch these folks. Yeah. It's it is. It's extremely. Yeah. It's like one of the things we run across yeah. when we do talk to these people, they'll say, well, I got that from a friend. Uh -huh. We have to prove, you know, how they got it, where they got it, if they're in control of it, for how long they're in control of it, what damage they caused or did not cause, if their ignition's punched and they're driving the car and they're using a the screwdriver to start it, and their background, you know, so a lot of those are factors. They get complicated. They, they're really in-depth cases at times. So would that not take precedence, the felony part? Because show me a $500 misdemeanor of a stolen vehicle. Uh, you're asking the wrong person about the precedence and who's going to, I mean, at the public safety meeting today, again, going back to, and I don't remember, I don't know if you guys were on the call or not, but I don't remember which um, police, the, uh, 
captain was talking, but what he said was they're going to get filed in Aurora because of the increased punishment that was just passed, unless there's a felony attached. So if you've got a pow pow, for instance, a pow, a pow pow is a possession of a weapon by a previous offender. There's a gun in the car. It's going to get filed as a state case, right? <clears throat> I don't. I assume that there's felony level damage that that's going to go to the district, the state court, district court as well. But I, that's literally a decision that's made by law enforcement in Aurora, which is an unusual process. Most state, county elected district attorneys have a charging deputy that makes the decision on what gets charged. In Aurora, if they come to Muni Court, it's the law enforcement that has writes the ticket and that's what the charges are. My assumption, again, is they will go to the 18th if it's in Arapaho, and it will go to the 17th if it's in Adams, <clears throat> or the 18th if it's in Douglas. But, I, I mean, we get what we get. I'm, I'm not like a private lawyer where I get to pick my clients, right? Right. I get what walks in the door, and we are mandated to take them. So, once again, show me a $500 stolen vehicle. Or I'm less. I, I'm pretty sure I can show you a $500 <laughs> vehicle. They're not in or, very good shape. Or less. Yeah, right? Or less. Yeah. But also, what are the chances, and you may be, I may be jumping the gun, that it gets plea bargained? Well, there were good chances before. Now, once this, once this law goes into effect, unlikely to get plea bargained at the municipal court level because there's no incentive. We're not, we can't ethically, if somebody walks in, let's, God forbid it's somebody's grandkid here that's 18 and steals a car, they're looking at 60 days in jail if they're convicted. Well, we're not gonna plead them guilty. We're gonna go to trial because it would be an ethical concern of mine if my lawyer started pleading people straight up to 60 days in jail. What if they can't afford the $500? I mean, whatever. So you're talking about the victim penalty? Or, well, so that's uh, a whole nother. Yeah, <laughs> the victim. Okay, so I want to I want to address part Just, of what you're saying because that, that is a that's something that I think gets overlooked in this whole process, right? <coughs> and that's the actual impact that it has on a victim. You might have a beater of a car that's worth five hundred dollars blue book, but that's how you get to work. That's how you get to school, whatever the case may be. So there's actually larger real damages to you. I don't know if that's a legal consideration um, that ever gets made or if it even can be made, but that's, a, that's I think another conversation. But that's actually part of what we did pass uh, that, I, that I was supportive of on council is we're gonna try to find a way to set up a victim's assistance fund so that we can make folks whole. Because I feel like that's the very least we can do um, you know, when folks are when folks experience something like this. You know, it's the emotional damage, the stress, but also the financial damage. So we can at least help offset some of that. Yeah, so I just wanted to bring that part up. I also want to be respectful of Doug's time and everyone else's time here. So if, uh, are there any other questions on that point? Okay. You kind of just touched on it. Um, I was going to ask if the public defenders actually do um, take like victims, because I was a victim of a stolen car. And or not a stolen car, it was actually a license plate. Ironically, I was canvassing, and someone stole my plate from Target and used it in a condition. And so I could have gotten charged with that crime. So as a public, public defender, what do you do to protect victims? Well, I like to think what we do to protect victims is to represent people's constitutional rights. But I don't have an allegiance to anyone but the guy or gal sitting beside me at the chair, which oftentimes I think victims and the community think that I condone the client's actions. I do not condone the client's actions. I've been involved in a lot of high profile cases over the years. Uh, I did death penalty defense for 20 years. Um, I have no hair and a big belly right now, so. Um, I don't condone the homicides that my clients did, but I believe that they deserve every ounce of my ability to defend them uh, under the Constitution. I have empathy for the victims, but I don't represent the victims. That's, what the prosecutors do, um, and that's their obligation because they represent the people, or in this case, the city of Aurora. 
I don't. I represent the guy that's got the D beside him, right? Say so Roar versus Joe Smith. That's my guy. And the victims, unfortunately, are witnesses in the case oftentimes. But it's not my responsibility. And I know that sounds trite. Um, I've been asked the same question for four years, like how can you represent those people? And my answer is I don't know how I cannot represent them because that's what the Bill of Rights says. And I'm a big believer in it. If my guy gets caught, and my guy, and it's a fair trial, and they get convicted, I, I'm okay with that too. So I, so I don't want to be selfish or not, but can I ask like one follow-up question? Sure. So what would you recommend as community, community members that we do to basically make sure victims' rights are, are protected better or are increased where we feel safe and protected by those who represent? Well, I think you talk to those who represent the council. But you also talk to your prosecutors. There is a victim's rights uh, uh, act. And there's a victim's rights amendment uh, in this state. Now, the amendment is two sentences long. It's not much. Um, but the enabling legislation is very lengthy. And, but you have to remember, I want to defend prosecutors, which I don't do very often. The, the victim's rights amendment and the victim's rights act it's really about notification. It's about making sure you're informed and it's transparent about how the system works. If a deal was struck, when people go to court. It is not a sword that says, because I'm a victim, you have to prosecute my case. The, the prosecutors, whether they're city, state, federal, uh, or county or federal, have independent discretion on what they charge, who they charge, and how they charge. And if they, they have an ethical duty to only charge if they believe they can get a conviction. Otherwise, their responsibility, overarching responsibility, is to seek justice. Sometimes that's filing charges, sometimes it's not filing charges. So the people that are there to protect your rights are gonna be whatever level you're at, municipal, state, or federal prosecutors, and your elected officials. Questions? Come on, I usually get really hard questions from you guys. <laughs> well, it's a good thing you got the sixth of them in here too, then, right? I couldn't hear it. No other questions? <laughs> I'm really not trying to take up time, and I'm not trying to be the most controversial, but I, I do have a lot of questions. Actually, one question. Um, the other hot button issue in Aurora is about homelessness and whether or not it's criminalized or whatnot. Um, so my question is, if a if if a someone who's who's unhoused or whatnot is is charged with that loitering or whatnot, would you would you take that case or how would you how would you approach that? We have a tremendous number of homeless clients. Um, and a tremendous number of folks with mental illnesses. Uh, and oftentimes both, the homeless and with mental health um, problems. So every day we go to jail. Uh, on Monday we had 18 people, which in my previous life wasn't a lot of people because we did 170,000 cases across the state of Colorado. But in Aurora, 18 people that got arrested over the weekend is a big deal. Almost all of those folks were homeless and or had some behavioral health issue, drugs or, or mental health. So we've actually built a mental health program inside my office right now, um, without any money from council, I might add, not a dime. Um, and we have forensic evaluators come in every morning at 7 a.m. to take a look at those folks. How many of those people were homeless? A, a tremendous number of folks are homeless that have mental mm. health issues. And what part of that program is we are working with forensic psychology interns to help us evaluate those folks. I have, for the first time ever in Aurora's history, we have a licensed professional counselor on staff. Um, also, not a dime from Aurora, um, from grant money, who actually helps the court out with M1s. M1s are civil commitments. 
Uh, if somebody is really, really sick and we don't want them sitting in jail, we can get them transferred over with the judge's order to a, a civil facility. Um, our biggest problem, honestly, are failures to appear once we get people out of custody. Mm -hmm. So even during COVID, we never shut down. The Aurora Municipal Court is one of the few places in the state of Colorado that never shut down. We went to court every day, we throw a mask on, and we represented people that were arrested tonight. Um, and those arrests, as COVID restrictions have gone down, those arrests have increased. It used to be we would see, during COVID, we'd have six or eight people on Mondays, and this Monday we had 18, or 14. Today we had eight. <clears throat> um, so from the mental health perspective, we have somebody coming in and looking at them immediately in cooperation with Aurora Mental Health Center. Aurora Mental Health Center actually runs the program, because I'm not a, I'm, I'm just a dumb lawyer, so I don't, I don't um, But they're helping us determine which people can use treatment, which folks are incompetent. We have an unbelievable high percentage of folks that come in that are incompetent to proceed. I think we have 40 clients right now and a total of 120 cases just that have where competency has been raised in, in this issue. From the homelessness perspective, we see, uh, we're gonna see more folks with us, I think, I hope not, but because of the camping. And, and they're not gonna be arrested for camping, but they are gonna be arrested, I think, at some point, if they're trespassing out or you guys can tell me to shut up if I'm saying this wrong. Um, but I think there's gonna be uh, the potential to have more homeless folks arrested for trespass because they don't have any place else to go or if they've been ordered to move on and they, they don't do it. Um, so I'm waiting for that to come as well as the motor vehicle thefts. I also want to point out that in the motor vehicle theft ordinance, I did try to amend the change um, so it, that it didn't apply to everything, that it just applied to motor vehicle thefts. But the failure to appear provision actually applies to everything as written. So if you are, for whatever reason, need to be in court and you fail to appear, it's 10 days, right? What's 10 days, 10 days. Right, well, we're gonna see if that's actually constitutional. We're, we're having a little battle in court over that one. <laughs> Primarily because there's no mens rea attack. So I mean, I testified at both council meetings on this and there's, Mens rea means, in order to have a crime, you have to have an act, and you have to have a culpable mental state, you have to be thinking something and doing something, or else it's not a crime. And we don't have the thinking part attached anywhere in the very to appear statute. We have the act, which is you don't show up. But we don't have whether somebody did, most failure to appear statutes include a willfully fail to appear, knowingly fail to appear, or intentionally fail to appear. We don't have that in the ordinance. So it just passes us. So you're talking about fair, failure to appear. Yep. And we've mentioned how some of Aurora City Council is modeled after Denver. So I know Denver has a, a, a day where they help the unhoused or whatnot, provide them with resources and stuff like that. And included in that day, they have a, a clerk where the unhoused who are charged with failure to appear or minor violations are are able to get that ticket um, taken care of. Does Aurora have something? No, like that? we don't. We don't. But it's interesting you bring that up. And I'll tell you why. Because in March, the Arapahoe County District Attorney's Office did exactly that. They did a warrant day, and they had a Saturday where people came in. The judges were there. Public defenders were there, etc. Uh, I just read about it. I thought it was a great program. I reached out to Judge Day this week and say, why don't we do this? And I picked March 18th, but it's a day, of course. <laughs> um, and what Judge Day told me is that he, who's the chief judge, that he would be open to it, but that we have tried a similar thing in the past before I got there, and it was not very successful for a, a lot of reasons. The unhomed don't have a way to get to court. Mm -hmm. That's why our biggest, one of our biggest problems is going to be the FDAs, the failures to appear on homeless folks. 
I mean, they don't even make the appointments with their lawyer, let alone get to court oftentimes. They don't have cell phones. Uh, part of this grant program we got, I just got uh, 20 cell phones preloaded, and we're gonna start trying to use those to get homeless folks that have mental health problems back to court. My guess is those phones are gonna disappear, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. They're gonna get stolen, they're gonna get traded, but it was a thousand dollar investment to try to stop people from getting locked up. Um, again, I got that from grant money, not from, I can't get money from the city of Aurora. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I can go get money from a, I got money from a competency fines committee and we're gonna have 200 or $320,000 next year. That's not gonna cost Aurora anything. Um, damn, I just asked for a pencil. And these guys won't give me the money for the pencil. Um, Keeps twisting the knife. <laughs> uh, so we're working with Aurora Mental Health to expand the program, the mental health program I've been talking about. It's called Aurora Sustained. You can read up about it. It's been written up in the Sentinel. And we have about a 50% engagement rate, which is phenomenal. So folks that are coming in that have competency issues, I sit down with the prosecutor, get the case resolved, and then we literally walk them over to Aurora Mental Health. And they've been engaging in treatment, even though there's no stick, about 50% of the time. We're gonna expand that, I think we're gonna increase it because we're gonna get peer support with the new money that I didn't get from the city of Aurora um, <laughs> in 2023. He hasn't asked, okay? Just throwing that out. So how much money do you get from the city? Uh, we get right now, I think my, I think when I started my budget was about $800,000 or $900,000. We are the lowest funded agency in the city of Aurora. We are now, if I could just get the, the change in the police department's couch, I'd be <laughs> so much um, Look at their cars. <laughs> we're at about 1.8 now. Um, and I just put in a request for two, just two little measly FTEs, so we'll see how that goes for me. Wait, yes, what, what, what did your budget look like? If you had, if we were in Dougland, yeah. if we were in Dougland, uh -oh. my budget, I'll tell you what my budget would be. My budget would be not only, I would have the ability to hire social workers, because that's the one thing that we're missing. Um, and social workers are so beneficial in trying to find alternative sentencing programs, mental health programs, <clears throat> alternatives to pro straight probation programs. <clears throat> we don't have any social workers. Um, most of my staff are attorneys and who do a really good job, but they're in court every day, right? So, uh, and it's me who's just, sorry, I'm just the ask us bureaucrat at this point in my life, and my admin staff, and that's, I mean, that's what we keep it running with. I would love to have a couple social workers to help us track down medical records, psychiatric records, look for alternative treatment programs, and try to get people into more uh, mental health and behavioral health programs. With that said, Aurora Mental Health has been fabulous. Um, when I went to them in early 20 and said, I, we need to do something about the folks that are coming in that are incompetent, they stood up, helped me set this program up, have not charged us a dime in two years. Haven't charged us a dime in two years. <laughs> um, social workers would be great. Do I need more attorneys? Yes. Um, but being able to get folks that can help us with alternative programs is critical right now, and including mental health and, and substance use issues. So the duck budget would be? Oh, well, I don't want the duck budget would be. Money. Numbers. Let me think that. Um, Roughly. If I could get uh, four MTs, so I, I need three lawyers. I'm gonna tell you why I need three lawyers. And because we start, uh, these guys know this, but starting January 1, we're gonna do courts on weekends. We've, we've never done that before, and now we're going to, we're actually gonna be in court every Sunday. Um, and we figured out the other day we're gonna be in court a total of 63 days on weekends. I don't 
we're going to get that staff because it was a unfunded mandate from the state and so we are going to get that staff i have two i've i've done a workload analysis which isn't done i know it's a long way to answer your question but we've never had a workload analysis I, i'm not big on rhetoric or saying oh i got more cases i need more people we actually have done tracked our lawyers time for the past year and a half and now I'm presenting that to the city council saying this is the time that we're putting in. And it's pretty easy math. You have this many hours a year divided into this many hours on the case and you get that many lawyers, right? I need two more lawyers. The, if that, that's probably, and then if I could get a social worker and another mental health, I probably need another four or $500,000. So that would take me to 2.5, 2.6, something like that. Yeah. Three. I'm, I'm actually very conservative. I believe I have a fiscal responsibility to the taxpayers as an elected fiscal. I mean, I've been doing public service for a long time. If I don't have the data to support my ask, you are never going to hear me make the ask. But I have the data. And with that kind of money, I think we could have some major inroads into stopping recidivism, mm -hmm. which is how I help protect victims, and stopping the failures to appear. Yes, ma'am. Would bus passes help your own Bus passes home? would be great. Would your uh, bus passes help your own home to people? Absolutely, 100%. Can you deal with uh, RTD on that? Um, so the head of my commission, uh, my public defender commission, used to be on the RTD board, and I would say, hey, Tom, how about some bus passes? And it's like, <laughs> uh, man, I mean, there's a reduced amount, but we don't, they don't, he's not on it. They don't give passes away. So mm -hmm. I don't have the budget to buy the bus passes. Like the cell phones, again, I got for a grant. If we had bus passes, I absolutely think it would be beneficial. Well, I think you should approach your Aurora City Council for a mobile unit. There you go. <laughs> the Doug Whoa. Land Band, I like that. <laughs> if, they, if they are into the uh, mental health system, they have bus passes that they give out to them. They also have cell phones. If they are under the Connect for Health um, Colorado, the ACA, they are eligible for cell phones also. So they just have to get into the system. Here's the biggest it's problem with our problem. clients that are in the system. They drop out of the system. Right. So this reconnect that we're doing, exactly. when they get arrested, it's not just a roar. They're arrested, and it's only if they have a competency issue. We will get them handed off. I mean, it's a pretty transient population, mm -hmm. and you go back and forth across Yosemite, and mm -hmm. you're in Denver, and you're in Aurora. And so we also work with Denver Mental Health, though most of the time it's Aurora Mental Health. If they're in, and they've dropped off the radar, we're getting them back in, and they're back in with their, their uh, therapists. But if they've been out for a while, they don't have those bus passes or cell phones. Right. in many halfway houses. I like the idea of the bus passes, but the halfway houses only give the bus passes on a daily basis, not a monthly basis, mm -hmm. and that's a big problem. If they're giving out the passes on a, on a monthly basis, they're, they're making the residents pay at a reduced rate instead of, in, instead of giving a, a, free, a free rate, because that's how mo most, of, most clients in residential treatment centers are, 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 are unhoused, don't have a to go once, once they are released. So that's how the halfway houses are getting their rent, but they're not paying to their case managers and stuff like that. Uh, absolutely, and we don't deal with halfway houses much unless there's a state charge also associated with the, with the municipal. But let's do the math, right? right? If I got a guy that doesn't show up, that's gonna get 10 days. Right? It's $129 a day in the Arapahoe County Jail right now. So that's $1,300. Right? What's a bus pass cost? Even if they, and I'm not naive enough to think that they're not going to sell the pass or give the pass away or lose the pass because it's going to happen. Maybe I get a 10% return. I don't know. But I promise you that one guy who's going to 
charge or it's going to cost the jail $129 a day because that's what Sheriff Brown told me it costs these days. It's a lot cheaper to buy the bus pass, even if it's one guy, right? As far uh, as the jail so, time, oh, sorry, who yep. covers that cost? Is it the jail or is it well, the that's state of Colorado question. or? Because they have, they, isn't it like private prisons, right? No, it's no, not private. These are public no, jails. No, no. Oh. Those costs we offset through our property taxes. Mm -hmm. Sheriff Brown testified at the oh. city council meeting in June about the Puerto Rico theft that he has 1,458 beds and they're available for Aurora for the motor vehicle. I mean, that's how serious he is about wanting to end the motor vehicle theft. Adams County, which is in a bit of a disarray right now because the sheriff, the incumbent, lost his primary. Mm -hmm. So I don't know who the new sheriff's going to be, but there's a Republican and a Democrat now that are running for sheriff. It's going to be Republican. Well, what I've been no, because for it's it's a Republican I, turned Democrat. Well, I, I'm not saying I don't care if it's Republican. Or Democrat. What are you talking about, sheriff? What I was told by Adams the last county? year is that Aurora has 14 beds in Adams County. Well, that's it. And you're right. There was a fight. Back when the chief used to, it was the old chief, there was a fight about the, the, the sure. yeah. payment. But right now, there's only 14 beds in Adams County. And I, didn't, I don't know what that means when it goes over the 14 beds. If there's going to be a per bed cost, mm -hmm. it doesn't sound like there will be an Arapaho, according to Sheriff Brown. But I don't know what it means in Adams, and I don't think anyone's going to know until the ordinance goes into effect and you get a new sheriff who decides how he's going to run his jail. I just know until the new sheriff comes in, because I get monthly reports from Adams County as to how many of our clients are in their 14 beds. So it's also been said that a lot of these people, you get three squares and a cot, which is an Who said that? We've said that in the community a lot. Okay. Because when you have that and you're out in the blizzard or whatever, it's much better to have three squares and a cot than being in the whatever, in the conditions. Okay. You know, like a blizzard or whatever. So, hey, you're getting three squares and a cot for 60 days. I, have you ever been inside the gym? I've not been other okay, I've been in almost every jail and prison in the state of Colorado. There's not one I'd want to spend a day with whether I was hungry or not. So I'm sure that people that have not been incarcerated will throw that around. Well, this has been from like a social worker who worked with the judicial. But did she spend any time in jail? I think she has. I mean, not, right? not as a I mean, whatever. I have, I have spent nights in jail to see what it's like in negative conditions. There's not kind of, maybe if you go get arrested in the general community, it's a little bit more country clubbish, but um, the jails are tough. So, when I hear three cots and three squares, three cots and three squares. Cots, uh, yeah, the, I would, let me just tell you about the Adams County Jail for the first three months of this year. They had no hot water, they had no hot meals oh. uh, for three months in the middle of COVID. And I talked to the sheriff numerous times about it. They had a, uh, a line that burst, so they lost their hot water. The kitchen staff quit, and it was bologna sandwiches, three meals a day. That doesn't sound like three hots in a cot to me. But three squares. <laughs> All righty, so I just want to recognize that it's eight o'clock, so we're already a little over. And I also do want to uh, close this out with a couple of updates. So can we give Doug a round of applause? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So I apologize for the tech issues. I'm very grateful that you were here. And it sounds like um, there was a lot of maybe questions or conversation yet to uh, you know take place. So after you recover, if you're willing, I'd love to have you back. Well, I'm, gonna go. I'm gonna call you at three in the morning when I'm on the way to the hospital. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right, awesome. Thank so you. thank you so much, Doug. And uh, yeah, I did want to just uh, close out with a couple of miscellaneous announcements here for you all. So first, uh, this Saturday, between nine and uh, sorry, between eleven and four, uh, we have the family safety check event taking place at uh, the J.C. Penney parking lot at the Aurora Mall. 
So this is, I think, the fifth one of these events that we've put on. So you can get your car seats, help with car seats, uh, get steering wheel locks, gun locks, drug disposal bags, and this time, the State Patrol is also going to be providing catalytic converter branding stickers. So you'll be able to chemically etch your catalytic converters uh, in addition to having the sticker on them, so it makes them a lot less attractive with the steel. They're much easier to track that way. Uh, so definitely swing by there. There's also going to be miscellaneous swag bags and food. Uh, so yeah. So definitely uh, swing by. Again, that is between uh, 11 and 4 p.m. Um, at the J.C. Penney's on uh, a parking lot over at the Aurora Mall. And then the last thing I wanted to let y'all know about uh, is uh, I've gotten, I don't know if it's from any of y'all in the room right now, but complaints about very noisy neighbors uh, and then how difficult it is to actually have anyone do anything about it. Um, our law currently as it stands, you have to have an officer show up and witness the issue happening and then make a determination themselves whether or not to cite somebody. Uh, so I actually have amended our code and that'll be coming forward to committee pretty soon here. Uh, Basically, code enforcement is now able to issue those citations as well, so it makes it a little more likely that someone will be able to respond in the moment. And if you don't have uh, APD or code enforcement that are able to respond, you and a neighbor uh, can gather, at, you know, can hopefully record the incident happening, sign an affidavit, and then submit that to the city, and it'll be given to code and APD to evaluate, and you'll be able to actually issue a complaint that way and uh, kick off the uh, citation process in that way. So the, the goal with this is to make it so that if there's repeat nuisance issues in your community, that you're able to actually get some reprieve and take some action on your own if we don't have city staff um, available to deal with those issues when they occur. So uh, that's, like I said, it's coming to, co to committee soon. If you have any questions or concerns about that, I'm happy to take those from y'all now before we close out. Isn't that after 10 p.m.? So because I thought they could be allowed as they want until after until 10 p.m. Until 9, I think it's, it's 9, <laughs> okay. uh, is, I think what the cutoff is. But basically, I know that I've had some uh, issues, like in actually Chatsford, just across from where uh, you and I live, Aaron, uh, where folks have like house parties at like 2 yep. in the morning on a work night, yes. you know? And, <laughs> and so it's like, what do you do about yeah. that? You know, um, the amount 